good afternoon. This is me, Joshua, and beside me, you have JC right here. And I welcome you to Pixelate's basic software training program. Here at Pixelate, we aim to teach you and to help you guys learn about the latest technologies found in the web, as well as to inspire others to learn how to develop their own software, as well as to establish their own applications and to build their own services. So, with that in mind and with that vision in mind, we came up with this tutorial and this training program in order to help you guys to learn how to make your own applications as well as to teach you guys what we are already using here in our company. So, for the first topic, we have Git version control and GitLab. You might ask, what is Git? So for those of you who are not aware of what is Git, Git is a free and open source distributed version control system. So a version control system is a way of handling file versioning based on your changes. So for example, you have a single file and then you modified it and then you want to save a snap or rather you want to save that specific instance without losing the previous one. So what's going to happen is your first, or rather your first instance is going, to, is going to be saved as well as your second instance. So think of it as a way of handling different versions of your files. So if you have several versions, let's say four versions, what's going to happen is Git has four versions of those files, meaning version 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then you can swap versions based on the or rather based, based on what you want to use the version of the, this instance. Let's say you want to use the version 2. So you can use the version 2 anytime you want. As well as you can use, you can also use the version 4 anytime you want as well, without losing all of those at all. So Git is useful for those of you who are new to version control. And then for people also who never use Git in the first place. And then lastly, for those who use Git GUI tools, because, G because Git is mostly used in a terminal sense. But that does not mean that Git does not have a UI itself. So there are several applications that provide UI for Git itself. So for the installation, you simply go to git scncom and then you download the latest version for the application itself based on your operating system. So once you do that, you simply install Git. And then after installing Git, you now have an instance of Git in your laptop or in your machine. So once that is installed, you need to first set up your Git instance. So later on, we're going to demonstrate how to set up your own Git instance. So first, you're going to check the version. So you will see here that you have um, you have several commands to run in a terminal. So first step would be to check the version. Now why is that? Because Git's behavior is different for each version. That's why we recommend that you first check the version of your Git in order to look, or rather, in order to look for the specific documentation for that version. <clears throat> Next is you're going to set your configuration values. So what are these configuration values? Namely these two. These two values are important in order to tell Git that you are, or rather that your user, which is you yourself, has a specific name and email. Because Git utilizes the name and the email as a way of identifying from, or rather as a way of identifying who created the commit, who pushed the commit, and then who sent those commits, or rather who merged, and everything else in between. For the getting started feature, you have two common scenarios. So the first scenario would be your project is on your local machine. So that is the most common instance. And then another instance would be you have an existing project on your remote for, or rather in this case, in GitLab. So if you, if for, for instance, your project is on your local machine, what you need to first do is to initialize a repository. Now, a Git repository is a virtual storage of your project. So think of it as a bucket of some sort. So 
any changes you make to your code base will be stored in the buckets. And any changes you apply or you update or you delete will be stored permanently in your virtual storage. So it allows you to save versions of your code. Meaning, if you initialize your Git at the very first or rather at the very start of a project or if a or a very beginning of the project code base, as, as long as you use Git and you continue to commit and update and merge, your entire code base version is in or rather is kept in a safe storage. No matter what happens, all of your code's evolution as well as devolution for that matter is saved in your virtual storage. So all of the changes are trapped inside a Git repository. So no changes are left behind. So everything is stored. So in case you, for example, in case you break your code at a later point in time, you can always roll back to a previous version. So there's no harm with that. So with that in mind, you can safely code and as well as you will not be, or rather you are not afraid to commit mistakes that much because you can simply roll back in a safe point in time or rather in a stable point in time. So in order to initialize a repository, you simply need to type git in it. So what this does is it initializes your git repository in your current directory, wherever they may be. Next, before you make any movements with your repository, you need to first check the status of your repository using git status. So what does, what does git status do? Git status basically shows you the status of your repository as well as to check for any changes whatsoever. And then next, we will need to add a git ignore file. So you may ask, what is a git ignore file? A git ignore file is a type of file that tells Git itself that whenever you encounter a file type of this extension, you ignore the changes from that, or rather you do not include them in the Git itself. So there are instances that you do not want to commit some files inside of a Git repository. For example, the, the also dreaded node modules, the, the, the heaviest matter in the universe for that matter. So aside from those, you also do not want to store vendor folders inside your Git repository because what happens is if you do that, you're going to blow out the entire code base. In order to avoid that, we need to add specific Git ignore files for that in order to ignore the node modules as well as to remove specific files from the code base because we do not need them to, or rather we do not need to store them because we can simply reinstate them anytime. So for the Git states, you have three states for that. First one is you have a working directory, which is your current work base. So for example, you have a folder somewhere in your SAMP directory. So that is a working directory. Or rather, a working directory is any directory wherein you apply or you apply changes to the code itself. So before it before it gets transferred to the staging area, you need to first stage your fixes. Now fixes are those types of or rather, fixes are code changes which needs to be updated to the staging area itself. What it does is, in a sense, you're like, uh, what do you, how do you? So, you're like moving your changes in a specific area without affecting the entire state. What it means is you're preparing this fix, or rather, these code bases or these changes to be committed to the repository itself. Once you have your staging area ready, or rather you chose what you stage, you commit them to your repository. That means you're going to add them as a snapshot to your list of changes in the repository. Again, first you have a working directory wherein it is the area wherein you apply changes to your code, you change the specific text file or an HTML file or any file for that matter. And then after you modify those files or once, the, once you are done already with your transactions or your updates, you stage all of those fixes to a staging area. It's like, a, it's like akin to a cart. So all of those changes, you put them inside a cart to be checked out into a repository. So, once all of your changes are in the staging area, you commit them. And then after you commit them, the repository gets updated. So now that it is updated, you need to check out your project to your working directory. So this checkout mostly happens for those instances where you have multiple users or multiple developers working on the same code. So every time you change the repository itself, you need to tell your workmates or your colleagues 
that a change has been pushed in the repository itself in order for them to pull those changes back to their working directory. Now, why is that? It is built that way because Git is a decentralized system, meaning every user who has a copy of the repository has a complete copy of the repository itself. So in a sense, if you have, let's say, five developers or five colleagues, if you all check out the same repository, all of you have the exact copy of those files across all of those five machines. Meaning, if one of you, in case one of you fails or one, or one machine fails, you have four redundant copies of that same repository, as well as the one in the cloud, in case you have a cloud instance. So whatever happens, your Git repository will always be intact as long as they have multiple copies of it. Next, before you make any movements with your repository, you need to first check the status of your repository using git status. So what does, what does git status do? Git status basically shows you the status of your repository as well as to check for any changes whatsoever. And then next, we will need to add a git ignore file. So you may ask, what is a git ignore file? A git ignore file is a type of file that tells Git itself that whenever you encounter a file type of this extension, you ignore the changes from that, or rather you do not include them in the Git itself. So there are instances that you do not want to commit some files inside of a Git repository. For example, the, the also dreaded node modules, the, the, the heaviest matter in the universe for that matter. So aside from those, you also do not want to store vendor folders inside your Git repository because what happens is, if you do that, you're going to blow out the entire code base. So in order to avoid that, we need to add specific git ignore files for that in order to ignore the node modules as well as to remove specific files from the code base because we do not need them to, or rather we do not need to store them because we can simply reinstate them anytime. So for the git states, you have three states for that. The first one is you have a working directory, which is your current workbase. So for example, you have a folder somewhere in your SAMP directory. So that is a working directory. Or rather a working directory is any directory wherein you apply or you apply changes to the code itself. So before it, before it gets transferred to the staging area, you need to first stage your fixes. Now fixes are those types of, or rather fixes are code changes which needs to be updated to the staging area itself. So what it does is, in a sense, you're like, uh, what do you, how do you? So you're like moving your changes in a specific area without affecting the entire state. So what it means is you're preparing this fix or rather these code bases or these changes to be committed to the repository itself. So now once, have, once you have your staging area ready or rather you chose what you stage, you commit them to your repository. That means you're going to add them as a snapshot to your list of changes in the repository. So, Again, to, to repeat, first you have a working directory wherein it is the area wherein you apply changes to your code, you change the specific text file or an HTML file or any file for that matter. And then after you modify those files or once, the, once you are done already with your transactions or your updates, you stage all of those fixes to a staging area. It's like, a, it's like akin to a cart. So all of those changes, you put them inside a cart to be checked out into a repository. So once all of your changes are in the staging area, you commit them. And then after you commit them, the repository gets updated. So now that it is updated, you need to check out your project to your working directory. So this checkout mostly happens for those instances where you have multiple users or multiple developers working on the same code. So every time you change the repository itself, you need to tell your workmates or your colleagues that a change has been pushed 
in the repository itself in order for them to pull those changes back to their working directory. Now, why is that? It is built that way because Git is a decentralized system, meaning every user who has a copy of the repository has a complete copy of the repository itself. So in a sense, if you have, let's say, five developers or five colleagues, if you all check out the same repository, all of you have the exact copy of those files across all of those five machines. Meaning, if one of you, in case one of you fails or one, or one machine fails, you have four redundant copies of that same repository, as well as the one in the cloud, in case you have a cloud instance. So whatever happens, your Git repository will always be intact as long as they have multiple copies of it. So in order to add files to the staging area, you simply need to type git add, and then you type the file name itself. Or in the case of you want to stage all of your items, you simply add a dash a parameter in order to commit all of those files inside the staging area. And then you check the status of your staging area using git status. And then in order to remove files from the staging area, you simply need to type git space reset. So it resets the staging area, and then now you're free to apply new changes to your staging area. And then lastly, after committing the files to the stage area, or rather after staging those files, you need to commit those files to the repository now. In order to do that, you need to simply git, you need to simply type git commit space dash m in order to create a message and then you append your message. So in this case, what are your changes to the code? So in, in terms of messaging, before I forget, the commit message is an important way of communicating between colleagues. So as much as possible, we suggest that if you're going to type commit messages, always use the first word of your commit as an action word. For example, add, update, delete, modify. Use action words for your first word in your commit message. That is, or rather you might ask, why is that? The purpose of that is in order for the developer to be quickly identified or to be quickly notified about what that commit specifically does. So at the first glance, you will know that, ah, this commit changes the following files. This commit updates the following. This commit removes the following. So with that, uh, with that type of messaging in mind, you, you, in a sense, your team saves a lot of time instead of typing up cryptic messages or any message you might want to apply. Also, there is also a rule of thumb for the Git, or rather for commit messages, to type a very short, descriptive, straight to the point, one sentence commit message in order to make it as concise as possible. Because there are instances that a specific commit changes a lot to the code, or rather creates a lot of changes or makes a lot of breaking changes to the code itself. So in order to make the story short, you need to create a single descriptive and concise commit message in order to save everyone's time as well as to make your commits more descriptive and understandable. Lastly, after, after committing your files, you need to check your status and then you need to check the logs. So git log basically shows you the current state of your repository. So in order to check the repository itself, you need to simply type git log. So for the git workflow, this is a, or rather this is one of the most basic workflows in git, or rather one of the, mo one of the common workflows when it comes to development with git. So first you need to, of course, code and then once you're done creating your code, you stage them to your repository. And then after staging them to the repository, you commit them. So after committing them, now at, at, at that point in time, the code itself is already inside the repository, right? So if you have a cloud instance of your Git, let's say you have a remote repository, which is later on we're going to show you via GitLab, what you're going to do after committing is to push those changes to the remote. Now, why is that? We need to do that in order to create a redundant copy, which is safe or 
rather, which is safe within the cloud itself. So we don't have to worry about that anymore. Now, for anyone or rather for any developer who would like to update his version of the code itself, he needs to pull from the remote back to his local machine. So in a sense, you can visualize how collaborative workflows happen in a Git workflow. So first you need to code and then you stage the code and then you commit the code. After committing, you push them to the remote, which gets transferred to the cloud. And then after it gets pushed to the cloud, you have your colleagues who will pull those changes to their own copies. And then the work continues on as well as it gets repeated over and over again. So that is a Git workflow. If you see this video has been useful for you, please don't forget to click the like button as well as to hit that subscribe button to get notified of our latest updates as well as when new tutorial videos get uploaded. Again, this is Joshua from Pixelate. See you in the next video, Pixelators!